Welcome to uh, another episode of the Bleeding Edge of Digital Health, folks. I want to uh, welcome today's guest, Craig Froudy of Med Zero. Uh, Craig, thanks for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. I look forward to our discussion. Absolutely, absolutely. So our challenge is getting this thing on the books, but um, uh, looks like we're gonna we're gonna finally hit pay dirt here. So I really appreciate you taking some time. To, uh, to come talk to us. As I've expressed to you uh, in our conversations leading up to the show, this, uh, you know, the, 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 the genesis of this show or is really, you know, I want to um, highlight the, what I believe are really going to be the game changing technologies in digital health moving forward. That digital health uh, umbrella is a big, um, that's a, that's kind of a catch-all phrase it seems these days, but um, you know I think it, 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 inviting you 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 to come represent uh, uh, Med Zero on the sh- on the show was really um, indicative of exactly what I wanted this show to be, which was it's it doesn't have to be a therapeutic product to be you know a, a key component to digital health, you know it could be trends, it could be. Um, services. There's a lot of things that are that, that fall under that umbrella that I think um, are really going to be, you know, what I call game changers. And I saw your guys' press release a while back, and uh, it, it caught my eye immediately. So I, I'm really glad we were able to put this together. I wanted to st- set the stage today, Craig, with three statistics that I actually I got off your website that were visually arresting when I was doing some research on Med Zero. The first was. Fifty-one percent of the population have, I think it was in the last year, deferred care due to cost, uh, deferred medical care due to, you know, concerns about not being able to make the payment. That that was an eye-popping statistic. Uh, the second is that sixty percent of the population expressed uh, difficulty in paying their 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 portion of their bill, and sixty-seven percent of bankruptcies, personal bankruptcies were due to uh, medical costs, healthcare costs. Um, I mean, uh, let's, you know, I always like to start this with, you know, tell me a little bit about just kind of an overview of, of the company and how you got you got involved, but these types of statistics had to play a part in you saying, hey, this is something I want to be involved in. Yeah, and I think it's important to point out or just clarify that those first two stats that you mentioned were not just among the general population. Those are among the those that are employed and have employer-sponsored health insurance. So this isn't about Medicaid and Medicare populations. It's people that are actually going to work every day and have an employer-sponsored plan, and they're still deferring care uh, because they can't afford their out-of-pocket costs. You know, the, it, there's a million stats I could throw out. This is one of the few businesses I've run where I've actually had to pare down the number of stats and justifications because it gets so confusing. Yeah. But, you know, part of the issue is the out-of-pocket costs for employees over the last 10 years as it relates to health care have increased 162 percent so that's what people are paying out of their pocket their wages during that exact same time frame have increased 26%. yeah my guess would have been 20. And that's yeah, unreal it. yeah yeah so clearly there's you know increased exposure for people uh and at the same time you know you know or medical expenses just generally continue to increase. So let alone the out-of-pocket costs, you know, the U.S. healthcare system provides fantastic care in most cases, but it's it's overly complex and it's inefficient. Yeah. And by definition, those costs keep increasing. Therefore, it's impacting all of us. Um, and either healthcare premiums, insurance premiums are going to have to increase and or the out-of-pocket costs and exposure have to increase. So there's just it's just pure and straight math, unfortunately. It's technologies like this. I mean, I, I, I've said it before. If I've said it once, I've said it a million times. I think you know these di- digital health technologies that are going to enable things at scale. Um, this this might be our last great hope to to really rein in our healthcare system. And uh, I, you know, who knows if we'll ever be able to get it you know uh, right sized to you know to where we we would hope it is but certainly the a lot of these digital health technologies are going to play a, a big big part in improving care but also decreasing the burden on the individual um and you don't want the last thing you would want is somebody making a decision about their health care because of cost because if that's happening it's just you know it's just a snowball effect we know what's going to happen they're going to delay getting that hip revised they're going to compensate on the other side and that hip's going to go out now now they've got to have two 
hip replacements or or whatnot it's uh, you know it's a, it's a domino effect for sure you've got an interesting background i i said this the first time we talked i don't know how you got involved in med zero but you literally from a you know uh, i always look at things from a recruiting perspective given what we do and kind of how did this how did he he or she get aligned with this company and you know i always like to contrast and compare people's backgrounds with the role they're in like are they you know was that an obvious choice or, or or whatnot? I was, you know, in looking at your background and then learning more about Med Zero, it was obvious. I was like, man, this whoever found him for this role, it was almost like, uh, you know, it was almost like it was your your background was custom custom made for it with your uh, experience with WebMD and then also, um, you know, working with payment systems in the past. Tell me a little bit about you know, tell me a little bit about the company and how you got involved. Yeah, I mean, this is really, you know, the culmination of the last, you know, unfortunately for me, 25 years of uh, my work experience. So um, I have a son that's 25, so it's easy for me to kind of mark my uh, my history. Sure. Uh, I, I started a company 25 years ago called WellMed, and we were one of the first companies to really put uh, personalized health information on the Internet. So if you think about 25 years ago, we started maybe nine months after Amazon started uh, just selling books on the Internet. So we were way early, but we had what was called a health risk assessment test that people would answer specific questions about their health background and everything. And then we would deliver personalized information talking about, you know, their health, their individual health risks. So not the generic health risk, but specifically because you have a family, you know, history of heart disease and because you're obese and because you have poor, a poor diet, like the combination of those three things would indicate that you're at extreme risk for heart disease. And then we would have behavior modification. Uh, programs on the back end where we would actually tie in internet-based pro uh, programs to help people, you know, lose weight, exercise more, have better nutrition, all that kind of good stuff. We eventually bought a health coaching platform so people would uh, jump on the on, on the phone and actually support these folks that were at high risk. It's behavior correction, trying to, to improve the behaviors that are going to impact health for sure. Yeah, identification and then modification, helping people make small changes so in the end they make a big change. And the only reason they would do it is if they know that they're at risk. So we, we built that business up. My customers were large companies. So they didn't care about your individual health risk, but they cared about their health risk in aggregate. So do we have a lot of smokers? Do we have a lot of diabetics? And then they can apply programs and resources against that to minimize their costs because most large employers are self-insured. So they pay some of the employee premium, but ultimately they're responsible for their out-of-pocket, for their, their total health care costs. So they want to minimize those costs if possible, which is a win-win. Right. They minimize their costs and the employees hopefully end up being happier and healthier. So my, my customers were giant national companies. So Starbucks, IBM, you know, Kroger, Walmart, you know, those types of organizations. So we grew that business up and we sold it to a, a company called WebMD based out of New York. Um, and WebMD has, you know, three businesses. They have a physician business where they push information and, and educational materials to physicians. Uh, they have a public portal where anybody can go log in. That's what most people know, advertising supported. And then they have what we call a private portal or WebMD Health Services, where we would customize these tools um, for these large employers. So the platform we would offer to Pepsi would be different than the platform we would offer to Dell based on what their needs right. were. So very successful. We grew it from zero people to 500, from zero in revenue to 100 million in revenue annually. And, and it was just a really, really good run. Um, and I, I enjoyed that dramatically. Um, and we had great success. So it was it was fun all the way around. A lot of work, but yeah, yeah. it's all good. So what is it um, these days, right? Unfortunately, <laughs> I live, yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, I live in Portland, Oregon, and WebMD was based in New York. So uh, every other week I was commuting out there to to work with the exec staff back there. And uh, I just, you know, I got tired of that after eight or nine years of doing that. So I took a little time off. Uh, I left, took a little time off. And then I, uh, then I jumped in to run a company called Care Payment. And Care Payment is a patient financing company. Um, again, I identified the same problems that we just talked about. Uh, but instead of, of offering this, this financing platform through um, employers, which is what MedZero does, we offered it through hospitals. And the reason we did that was because there's $50 billion written off every year, every year by hospitals in uncompensated care. And what that means is that the hospital delivered your baby and then you left and then you get a bill in the mail and you can't pay it. It's not, you know, most people want to pay their bills. You look at the surveys, 
Everybody wants sure. to pay their bill. It's just that they need to pay their rent and they need to pay their cell phone bill and they need to pay their car. Well, groceries and, and so hospital you know, bills. everything else, diapers, yeah, everything else it costs know, to live. There's a bunch of stuff above it. So the hospital tends to be at the bottom of the stack. So we would come in and we were not bad debt collectors, but we would come in and offer a program. And we'd analyze where the hospital was best at collecting. So we'd say, look, if you get paid, you should collect for 45 days. By the time the 46th day rolls around, Mr. Hospital, you know, you only collect 10% of what's owed at that point in time. So at that point in time, you should send the receivable to me as care payment, and I will create a patient-friendly program. So we had a co-branded card that we would send out to people. We'd welcome them to the care payment program, interest-free financing um, that we would offer to these, to these huh. patients, to the hospitals, and we would guarantee the hospital that they would get a higher return by using our program than they would uh, by trying to collect themselves because they're just not built to collect. They're built to provide service. They want to provide health care. <laughs> we don't want to be a bill collection. Agency. So we would step in and be the intermediary between, you know, date of service and collection so that we would collect before, you know, somebody has to threaten you with a, a lawsuit or something like that. So business was very successful. Um, my, and, and we sold that. It's, it's run out of Nashville now instead of Portland. And my challenge with it was sort of twofold. One, there was a lot of competition coming in. So the price points were coming down lower. We were one of two big national firms when, uh, when I came on board. And then suddenly, because we were, things were going well, we attracted a variety of competitors to jump in the marketplace. And number two, the reason, the way we made money was we would buy these, pro these receivables at a discount. So I would pay sometimes 80, sometimes 75% face value on that receivable. So if it's a thousand dollar receivable, I would pay $800 right. for that. So the hospital would take a $200 haircut basically. And, you know, my feeling was that's not the hospital's fault that they can't collect. It's it, the hospital didn't have that patient choose a high deductible health plan. The health, the, uh, the hospital didn't put that patient in a place where they can't afford their out-of-pocket healthcare costs. The health, the hospital system, they delivered your baby. They performed on their contract. Yeah, they did exactly what they were supposed to do. But yet they're going to take a 20% haircut, which means that you and I are paying for it if we right. pay our bills. Because the hospital's not going to not get paid. They're just going to keep increasing. Well, and, uh, and uh, yeah, was just, to your point, exactly. That's what I was going to say is if hospital knows that they're going to have to write off $3 million in receivables every year, they're just going to increase the costs over here to compensate for it because they've got to make x amount of dollars so it's yeah it's just a shell game you're just moving the money around a little bit so i originally tried to build med zero inside care payment um because i felt it was really a, you know the employer was putting the employee in a tough position not intentionally like there's no you know this is not a an intentional situation to where somebody's trying to exploit somebody else it's just a fact of where healthcare costs are and and you know creative ways to sort of finance and, and address those issues with an insurance plan or or without depending on, on your situation. But we couldn't do it because care payment had a bunch of revenue cycle, people that knew how to sell to hospitals, right. but didn't know anything about delivering benefit programs into employers. So when we sold care payment, one of the bidders on the platform was a, an investment firm here in Portland. And so they approached me afterwards and said, look, we have this little technology that does standard employee lending. So in other words, it wasn't about healthcare. It was somebody who, you know, you might want need to borrow $500 for a new set of tires or you might need to, you know, finance your daughter's wedding. So you would borrow $5,000 to do that. And then this technology would allow you to do that and then get repaid through the payroll system. And so this investor came to me and said, um, hey, you know, I looked at care payment and I looked at this little technology piece that we have. I wonder if there's something we can do in the employer sector. Really? And I was <laughs> like, man, I've been trying to build this for two years inside care payment. You just delivered me this. Yeah. Sauce. Was it literally, um, was it, so we, was it almost exactly what you had, had envisioned from a, you know, I always, I, from an, like from an engineering perspective, I always like to look at these things and say, was this what you were envisioning from like a, a logistical standpoint, how it would work and all that. I mean, he, he or she really had it kind of perfectly dialed in or was it just kind of close and you, you were able to tweak it? It, it was not perfect uh, by any stretch. And it was very early on. They only had you know one or two customers at that. But more so, they wanted to approach the market similar to what Care Payment did. So they wanted to approach the market by going into a geographic area and going to the hospitals and healthcare systems and negotiating a discount for fast payment. So um, they, they, that's where they felt they were going to make their margin. 
And so we spent about, I don't know, six to nine months, maybe retooling the program. I didn't believe that was the right way to go because I'd sold into right. hospitals and it takes forever, very complex, many different decision makers. And you would have to have such a large concentration of employees to get the hospital's attention in every given geographic area. I felt that would really slow down your sure. growth opportunity. So I was able to, you know, convince him uh, and them, frankly, but a couple of people in the company at the time. Uh, to look at it a different way. And so our model is we go into an employer. And so we've created, you know, we're a healthcare focused fintech company that at the end of the day is designed to provide on demand funds to employees for any out of pocket healthcare cost. So it could be hospital, which everybody thinks of immediately, it could also be dentistry, which is a huge source of out of pocket funds because usually your dental plan only covers 50% of your costs. So like my wife just got a crown, we had to have $2,000 out of pocket, um, even though we had insurance, right? Yeah, dental insurance is a sham. I mean, especially for private insurance, you know, me just calling up Blue Shield, sit they offer, do I, do I want, uh, I can't even remember the name of the dental insurance they use, but, um, you know, if you get, unless it's coming from like a, a corporate type environment. Oh man. And even then, you know, I was, I remember working at J and J Medtronic, you go to the dentist to have any type of work done other than just a cleaning. And I was blown away at how, how little they pay, but. Yes. I mean, you're exactly right. I, you know, so I've got another podcast guest for you. If you want to go off on dental insurance, he's, he's, his wife is a dentist and he's created a dental co-op uh, and they, they offer basically services without insurance. They're like, don't waste any money on dental insurance. We'll cover you and your out-of-pocket costs will be less. Huh. So it's like a concierge dental service. I would basically. love to hear more so, about that. Yeah. So, yeah. So it could be any qualified medical expense. It doesn't have to be, you know, the hospital thing. So we offer, we create this platform. We offer on-demand financing. It's interest-free. There's no fees. It's offered through your employer. You can use it for any qualified medical expense, anytime, any place that accepts a MasterCard. And then at the end of the day, we get repaid through payroll deduction uh, over between six and 24 months, depending on how, how large your your loan is. So it really is incredibly, and on top of that, if you have an HSA account, we actually route the repayment through the HSA, meaning that you're, play, you're paying with pre-tax dollars. So in addition to having on-demand funds at no interest, that you can spread out the payments, you're now saving 30% on your healthcare costs. So instead of paying $1,000 post-tax, you're going to be paying $700 post-tax because you're paying with those pre-tax dollars. So it's, it really is a win, win, win for everybody. The provider wins, the patient wins, and the employer wins. And so it's one of the few things in our third-party payer system where everybody benefits. So what's the limit on the amount that you guys will loan? The way, the way we work, I'll just walk you through how the process works, uh, which might be you know illustrative of, 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 and I'll answer that question directly. So what we do is we go into an employer we offer them up our, our services and everybody there, there's so to start off with everybody's eligible as long as you've been there 90 days at that employer as long as you're over 18. so there's no credit checks there's no restrictions other than than those two things you got to be over 18 because you're going to sign a contract with us and you have to be there 90 days just so we know we're not starting you know. the oversimplification of things is is a lost start um, this day and age so we, you know, so what we do is we connect to the payroll system. And based on that, we look at everybody's, you know, annual gross income, and we will lend you up to 5% of your annual gross income. So let's just say that you're an employee who's making $50,000 a year. Uh, we'll lend you up to $2,500. And that doesn't have to be one bill. It could be multiple bills. You just can't have more than $2,500 outstanding at any given time. <laughs> and so the way it works is you download an app or you log on to our website or the customized website for your employer. You log in and that's how that's where you see your spending limit. You don't know what your limit is until you log in. We then tell you, OK, Mike, you can now borrow up to twenty five hundred dollars for qualified medical expenses. And then here's how it works. So there's I think there's going to be two primary use cases. The first one is the one everybody immediately thinks of. OK, I've been in a car crash or I need to go you know, get my hip fixed to your point. But I will give you a real story. So I did get my hip fixed right before COVID happened. Two weeks before, I had to go in and, and get the hip replacement. We didn't know everything was going to shut down. We just got lucky. 
Um, so I walk in the door, nice lady sitting at the front desk of the surgery center. And she's like, oh, Mr. Trouty, glad to see you here. You're going to come out a healthy man. Um, but I did check your benefits. And I had a low deductible plan, by the way. And I did check your benefits. And you were going to owe no less than $1,000. <laughs> I said, okay, that makes sense. Uh, and because what happened is I had my low deductible plan of 350 or whatever it was. But then on top of that, what most people don't think of is there's a thing called coinsurance, which means that for any sort of procedure in the hospital or a surgery center, you're paying 20% of that cost. Up to whatever your maximum out-of-pocket cost is. Your out-of-pocket max, which is what everybody should look at on their insurance policy, by the way. When you go to select an insurance policy, go to look at that because that's going to be what your exposure is. Yeah, so I, so I said, great. So she goes, I'll tell you what, if you pay me today... I'll save you 5%. I'll knock 5% off your cost. I'm like, okay, sounds great. So you've got med zero. You press a button. I have an app on my phone. I press a button. It takes literally less than 20 seconds, if you're a good typer, to type in how much money you want to borrow at that moment in time. So you see what your spending limit is. See what you have outstanding. And if, as long as I had $1,000, I just typed in, I need, I want to borrow $1,000. I hit one button and up pops a virtual MasterCard. Unbelievable. And so all I do is I hand my phone over to the lady. She types in that MasterCard number, the expiration date, the CVV number, just like she would any other time. And voila, the doctor gets paid right there. I've saved 5%. And now I've got $1,000 that I owe med zero. Because we're connected to the payroll system, we begin to deduct, have payroll deductions over the next you know 12 months. So that's 24, maybe 25 pay periods, depending on how your company pays. So the payment amount, as opposed to $1,000 on my visa at 18%, it's actually going to be $41 per paycheck. And if you route that through your HSA, it's coming out of pre-tax dollars. Exactly right. So you're going to pay $700 on a $1,000 bill. Yeah. So again, everybody wins in that scenario. Yeah. Well, no, actually, you're going to pay $1,000 minus... Uh... 35%, so 650 uh, you, you said there was a, the second use case. Second use case is is even easier. And that's the way I, I think most people will use this. So I personally have used MedZero a few times, and you know, A, to make sure it works, but B, because it actually makes sense. Like who wouldn't want to just defer payments over 12 months as opposed to pay everything up front if you had a choice because there's no additional cost. So I've used it a couple of times. So the other way I've used it is, you know, what I think most people will do, which is you will receive your bill in the mail. And so you receive that bill. So in most time you don't have to pay at the point of care, right? It, you know, right. But if you receive the bill in the mail, same thing. I logged in. It took me longer to log into the doctor's website to make the payment uh, than it did for me to borrow the money. So all you do is same exact thing. Pop open the app, get your credit card number, uh, and then you just type that into the into the the payment system on the doctor's website, and you're done. That's unbelievable. So I think that's going to be the more common thing. Could be again, could be dentist, it could be glasses, whatever. Yeah, you need your, your uh, little Janie or little Johnny needs uh, uh, braces. That's a you know an un you know a un unforeseen cost, or maybe something you thought you know oh he or she will need it, but you know, a ways down the road, go see the dentist. All of a sudden, Dennis says, eh, it's probably a good time to put braces on. Caught a little bit off guard. Yep. That's an absolutely a no brainer situation there for, uh, just because it's so expensive. Uh, what, what blew me away, Craig, when I was researching this is it's, it's, it's zero interest and zero fees, right? Yeah. To the patient. Yep. That is unbelievable. It's, it's an employer sponsored benefit. You know, everybody scratches their head as they should. I would do the same uh, if I weren't inside the business. And how do we make money? Because um, clearly we're a for-profit. Um, so there's a couple things that we do. This is an employer-sponsored benefit. So the employer will will pay a very small fee for their employees to have access to these funds. So it'll be somewhere between twenty-five cents and one dollar um, per employee per month that has access to our platform. So if you're a large employer, it's twenty-five cents. If you're a smaller employer, it's going to be a buck. Um, so that's $12 per year maximum for your employees to have access to thousands of dollars of interest-free money. So that we start with that. On top of that, we charge a per loan fee. So there's a 7.65% fee that we charge to the employer for every dollar borrowed. And the reason that we chose 7.65%, it sounds pretty specific, and it is, it's intentional. Because if you have an HSA account and the employer routes money through that HSA, they don't pay any FICA tax on those <laughs> dollars that run through there. 
and that happens to be 7.65%. So you're just net netting it for them. Yep, that's that zero cost for the employer at that point. And then there's a small per uh, monthly fee per outstanding loan so we can service the loan. Right. We have people and technology and a bunch of stuff to be able to send out statements and answer phone calls and do all that. So the employer uh, typically pays that, but they could pass that $2 per month um, fee onto the employee should they choose to do that. Um, everybody we've worked with so far has, has paid that for themselves. So it's very inexpensive for the employer when you look at everything else. Especially in this day and age, um, you're seeing, you know, everybody talks about, you know, health, you know, uh, healthy lifespan and whatnot, but it really is in, in these companies' best interest. I mean, if these, if these p- employees are kicking their health, healthcare issues down the road, it's, it's not like that. There's no cost to that. That does come back and, and bite you in the rear end, uh, you know? And so, you know, if you, if you have people that are going to have access to healthcare, when they need it, the light that the I think the thought process would have to be, and there's I'm sure you guys have a you know an economic storyboard around this is here's you know what these costs look like if they if they keep snowballing and they and these it, these issues go from you know the patient had a hernia that they didn't have dealt have the surgery, then it became an estrangulated hernia, and then it you know then they they had a you know uh, an infection and you know, then it becomes a big problem, right? And they're, and they're out of work for three, four weeks because they're getting, so is that kind of the methodology when you're, when you're positioning it to, to who, uh, and I guess what I should ask too is, is who do you guys call on? Is it the HR administrator, HR administrator, chief HR of HR who, and is that the story of like, Hey, you want these people getting their health taken care of before it becomes a big issue? Yeah, I mean, there's there's multiple benefits to the employer from a financial, um, you know, ROI perspective. So you identified one of them. I would say the first one is actually most people tend to be overinsured because they're concerned about that big out of pocket cost. So in other words, many employers have at least two plans, if not three, that you can choose from as an employee. So you've got what's called a PPO, a preferred provider plan, um, which typically has higher premiums, so you're paying more every single month, but it has lower out-of-pocket costs and lower deductibles for the employees. A lot of people tend to gravitate toward that because they're like, well, gosh, if I go into the second option, which is a lower premium uh, every month, but a higher deductible, man, I might have $5,000 worth of exposure. I don't have $5,000, right? right? So we've got only 40% of Americans can come up with a thousand bucks without borrowing or selling something. So if you only can come up with a thousand and you've got a 5,000 exposure, that math doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Um, Either you don't get care to your point, or, you know, you do get care and you put it on your credit card at 18%. So that doesn't work very well. Or you, you know, you, you just, you know, you, you ultimately get care and can't pay, which is the $50 billion. So those are kind of your three options. So what we say is, look, let's, do some analysis and and then if we provide the safety net with these on-demand funds over here um then people can afford that lower deductible that higher deductible lower premium plan so we'll shift people over there that saves the employer twelve hundred dollars on average uh per employee per year that makes that shift because the employer pays the bigger piece of your premium than you do um so the employer typically pays 60 to 70 percent of the premium versus you paying you know 30 percent or whatever the numbers are and, you know, therefore, that's a big cost savings for them. That's number one. Number two is what you hit on, which is like this deferred care thing is only costing you more money. Any employer that's over 100 to 200 employees is typically self-insured. So they're financing the health care expenses. So that's why they oftentimes get this extravagant insurance policy. So they protect themselves against the million dollar baby right. because that does really happen sometimes. Um, but the reality is most of the cost is just in the gosh, Craig needs to go get his hip fixed, or we do have pregnancies, regular pregnancies, or we do have this, and that. And so if they can, you know, um, make sure that people are getting appropriate health care because they make it affordable, that benefits everybody just from a financial perspective. And the third thing is really, it's, it's a bit of a softer calculation, but there are some real numbers behind it around distraction and productivity. So financial wellness is a huge industry within corporations today, because at the end of the day, it impacts the employee. If you're sitting there and financially stressed, you can't, you're not performing well. And so this helps to just at least eliminate the medical stress. And I would say the the fourth thing, and, and 
Um, this may seem obvious, but it wasn't necessarily to me. And I've been in the business for a while. And we're working with a company out of out of uh, out of Utah. I, I won't name them yet because um, we haven't publicly announced it. But they're more of an industrial company. So we went to them and said, "Here's you know what we do and this and that." And the lady's eyes lit up. She's like, "Oh my God, this is great." And I'm like, "Oh, so you understand the problem?" She goes, "Understand the problem." She goes, "My people can't zoom into work. Yeah. They're truck drivers and they're guy they're, they're they're folks that are doing." So she goes, "They need medical care when their back goes out." That means that they need to get their back right. fixed because otherwise they can't get back in that truck. We aren't getting the productivity out of them because it can't show up at work. They aren't getting paid um, because they're not at work. And she goes, it just causes this whole downstream thing. So today, the way they deal with it is they put, they've built Med Zero internally within their company. They, they put $700,000 a year away in an account on January 1st that they use to advance medical costs unreal, uh, you know, for their employees. And then they get repaid through the paycheck, but they don't want to do that. That's not their business. Like that's a distraction right. for them. So they're going to, you know, shift their program over to us. So like, this is real. That's a means to an end. It is, is all it is for them. They're just, you know, they're doing it out of survival. They had to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Yeah. No, I mean, you think about it, you know, it's, um, there's, uh, you know, uh, countless professions, count, countless companies that there are, you know, industrial type companies and manufacturing type companies where there's there's occupational hazards. And when those occur, it's a bottleneck for the company. Yeah. It, it limits their productivity. It limits their ability to, to, to grow their business. So that makes perfectly good sense. Like how many people are in the company now? Where are you guys at from a developmental standpoint? It seems like it's still physically a rather small company, although it seems like you guys are are progressing quite nicely in terms of customers and, and visibility and whatnot. Where are you guys at? Or is it a round already? Well, I started my a round last Friday. So we started fundraising last Friday. So you are right. We're in the process of the a round, but we're, uh, yeah, we, so, you know, we really kind of, when I came on board, it, it's probably been, I guess I should know the date even, but I, it's probably been, you know, I committed to the company maybe 18 months ago. We closed our seed round of, of you know, 5.7 million, um, led by a group called True Ventures out of uh, Silicon Valley, huge seed investor. Um, they manage about 2.5 billion and, you know, they were like seed investors in right. Peloton, for example. So they, they swung for the fences as it relates to, uh, to companies. So they, they saw the opportunity here. We also got some money from a group called Village Global, um, which is, a, again, a fantastic investor out of the Valley and or out of San Francisco, technically. And, uh, and their LPs, their investors are some of the best known entrepreneurs, you know, Bloomberg, Zuckerberg, Gates, Abby Johnson from Fidelity. That's who they raised their fund from. Wow. So they'll be fantastic for us as we continue to grow our business with the contacts that they have. You talk about connections, huh? Yeah, it's going to be great. I mean, I, we, hadn't, we hadn't had the money in the bank a week, and I'm on the phone with Abby Johnson, the CEO of Fidelity. Unreal. Yeah, so it's going to be great. So, you know, this is my third startup um, that, I, that I've run. And, you know, you learn a little bit as you get older. And so we're not going to go fast and break stuff. That's not the way we're going to, you know, the, the famous Zuckerberg quote. We're not, we're not doing that here. This is healthcare and this is finance. Like, that's not a thing. Right. Two, reg two, two of the most regulated spaces. Exactly. So we're intentionally going slow um, just to make sure we understand the funds flow, to make sure we understand how consumers are interacting, to make sure we understand how we communicate this most effectively um, to both consumers and to providers. Uh, so, you know, so a couple things. We launched formally in, in late November. That is when the product actually went live. Um, as I mentioned, I, you know, I, I, I was the first borrower, so I can attest it yeah. works. Uh, and so that's great. Since then, we've gone, we've, uh, you know, we're going live with five. Our goal is to go live with five customers in the first quarter. And so we've got four uh, and, and we better get this last contract signed uh, before the end of this week. So that, that's our goal. So we want to go live with five. We have another five that we'll go live with in the second quarter. So we want to have 20 live by the end of the year. That'll grow to 34 by the end of, of, uh, of or no, I'm sorry, uh, closer to 48, I guess, by the end of next year. And then that'll be over 100, reaching over a million employees uh, by the end of the third year. So that's kind of the growth stat. 
Um, we're focusing right now on some small to medium sized companies. So our largest company will have 5,000 employees in it. And that's again, intentional. I, I, I want to control the rollout and I want to control how people are interacting with the product to start with. Um, and then we can scale and, you know, we'll, we're, we have a head start. There's a big moat in our business. You mentioned regulation. It's, it's very, you know, insightful because, you know, we have a relationship with the national bank that enables us to actually lend in all That's 50 great. states. When I was at care payment, we had individual state licenses, which is very uh, hard to manage um, and a lot of, lot of um, scrutiny at that level. So uh, national bank allows us to use their charter to go lend anywhere. We have a relationship with a group called loan pro, uh, which I think might've been one of the press releases you saw, but they're fantastic in helping us service the loans. They do all the math on the back end. So we don't have to create all these complicated, you know, in-house spreadsheets to do everything. So outsourced it's all sort of automated, which will be great. Yeah. And then we've got, you know, some relationships that, that are, are uh, pretty special relationships allowing us to scale through brokers and through other affiliated entities. So I think we've built, you know, I, I think we're, we've come out to a great start. We're right where we want to be. Um, and then we'll see this thing grow, I think pretty rapidly. Uh, so we're raising our series A right now. Uh, we'll probably do hopefully between somewhere between 10 to 15 million is the goal, which will take us out to, you know, to, to, to some pretty significant growth. Um, right now we've only got 10 employees. Uh, we have no salespeople. Um, I've learned a new term in this new world called founder led sales, which is me, yep. I suppose. We, we've really focused on the operational side of the business. So we've got more people in operations than we do in any other group in the, in the company. Um, so that we can make sure that we're, you know, performing at a level that, that's going to drive customer satisfaction and, and that we're not making any errors as it relates to the financial side of the business. I've, yeah, I've seen, I've, I've seen several founders posting on that as of late founder led sales. Uh, and, and, you know, it was, uh, it, I can't remember exactly what, what he said, but it, I won't, I won't say his name. You can. He may, I, I guess he wouldn't care. He posted it on LinkedIn, but he's, he basically said, don't be surprised if I cold call your ass, you know? And it's like, it's, it's awesome to see, right. uh, you know, founders right on the front lines, passionate about the technology and, and really, you know, driving, driving, you know, that, that, that relationship with the customer. But um, what would you see as, you know, kind of the big challenge you guys face moving forward? You know, it seems like you've got, you know, and and you like you said, putting all that money into operations seems like you've got a pretty well oiled machine, or as well of an oiled machine as you can have at this stage in the game. Uh, what's the what's what's the big challenge facing you moving forward? Yeah, I don't know that I'd say. You know, this is one of the first kind. This is going to sound you know arrogant and crazy, and I'm going to knock on some wood. But this is one of the first companies I've ever run where I don't think sales is. Yeah, it makes too much sense. Yeah, everybody I meet with, you know, their their two questions are. Why hasn't somebody done this before? Like, I don't get it. Um, you know, because it sounds so simple when I say it. Uh, and, and, and then the secondly, is just going to be a matter of scale, um, you, know, being, you know, being able to ensure that we can support the growth that we have. Again, you know, it, it's kind of crazy, but, you know, uh, um, my contact at Village Global, actually, when they were doing reference checking on me, Walmart was one of my customers at WebMD. So they were reference checking and, and they called and they said, hey, I just talked to the Walton family who's an investor in our fund. And they just called the head of HR at Walmart and she's really excited about this product and wants to talk to you. Do you want to talk to her? I'm like, no, we're not ready for Walmart. No, <laughs> I can't go support, you know, <laughs> the largest or second largest employer in the U.S. They would be the perfect. They will be great. They will be a fantastic customer at, at the right time. <laughs> you know, that that's the that's the model that would be awesome you know and obviously you'll get there but what is the challenge is it just so it's going to be really supporting that growth supporting the growth then is ultimately the challenge yeah making sure we have the right systems and people in place to be able to support that growth um as it happens and then i think the biggest opportunity which i would say is the other side of the challenge is really um my vision for our platform is much broader than financing. So we will do financing really well over the next nine months. We will learn how to execute and we'll, I'm sure we'll make mistakes and whatever, but we will learn from that. However, I believe we have a much bigger opportunity. I'll just. Yeah, that was actually my next question. Oh, good. I want to help people, you know, pick the right benefit plan. So when I was at WebMD, we got approached by Ford and Ford came in and said, look, you have all this data on my people. I know my people are overinsured. I know they're paying more for their insurance than they need to on a premium basis. And, you know, can you help people understand how they're going to utilize healthcare? 
So, you know, what I want to do here is build a sophisticated platform, or maybe we partner for it and JV with somebody, I don't know, maybe we buy a company, I'm not sure, but somehow deliver a decision support app that allows you as an individual based on your utilization. So we'll take a look at what you did the last 12 months, five pediatrician visits, one ER visit, you know, three primary care, but whatever you did. And then talk about what you're going to do next year. Gosh, is there something special? Are you pregnant or, you know, do you have to replace your hip? Whatever the case may be. Um, and then model that against, and then by the way, in addition to that, we'll also take a look demographically where you are. So, okay, healthcare is different if you're 25 mm -hmm. than it is if you're 55. So let's take a look at that and figure, you know, do some uh, math on that and figure out what you should be thinking about as it relates to utilization. And then we take a look and sort of map that out geographically. So healthcare in Los Angeles is different than healthcare in Portland, uh, different than healthcare in New York. So all of that comes together. And then we give you a guide to say, look, based on what you said, here's what your out-of-pocket costs are total. Premium plus out-of-pocket plus co-insurance on plan A, on plan B, and on plan C. Most people are overinsured. Most people yep. play defense, not offense. And so that's fine, but we can help you save money there. So at least be aware of it. And that helps the company save money as we discussed before. So that's number one. Number two, I want to integrate cost and quality. So here you're paying somewhere between 200 and 500 bucks a month for your health care insurance, you personally, and the company's paying their, their share of it. Let's use healthcare the right way. Like I'm lucky in that I understand what coinsurance versus a deductible versus out of pocket max versus, you know, a PBM, all these different things are as it relates to what I do. Uh, most people aren't, they do it once right. a year, if that. Um, and so they don't know what all this stuff means. So let's help you navigate this and ask the right questions. Make sure you ask if the anesthesiologist, if you're gonna have surgery is in network because that person does not work right. for the hospital. In most cases, they work somewhere, else. they have their own group. So you're going to get hit with a huge surprise bill if that person is not in network. So like, let's help people navigate. Then we finance, right? So we did that. We talked about that. Then we're going to do bill review. So now, you, I mean, if you've ever seen a oh hospital bill, I mean, are you kidding? I mean, it's like, it, it's, it's unintelligible. It's just absolutely nuts, yep. all the line items. So let's use our tech to go through, analyze that bill, figure out if you're, if you're overpaid, uh, and if you are, let's go back and talk to the hospital. Let my people go do that. We'll go negotiate with the hospital on your behalf yep. and save you some money. Now let's look at drug. Let's look at drug discounts. So, okay, you've got a drug plan. That's great. Um, if you have a high deductible plan, you're probably paying cash anyway, or you should be at least looking at it because you're probably not. You probably don't have enough drug expenses to hit your twenty-five to five thousand dollars deductible. Right. Most people don't spend that much money on drugs. Absolutely. Right so let's look at the cost savings that you can do if you walk in the pharmacy and pay with cash. Let's at least look at it. You don't have to, you could use your plan and you could pay $75 or you could pay cash and right. pay 10 up to you. Um, but at least know what your options are. Yeah. So then we had two, two other quick things. Then we're going to do something around healthcare credit reporting. So you may have seen the news lately that, um, you know, their hospital debt is oftentimes sitting on your credit report and, they're not as good as the credit card companies or banks at removing that debt when you pay it. So the government has stepped in and, and encouraged um, the credit reporting agencies. I don't think they've mandated it yet, but they've encouraged them to change that. So the three big credit reporting agencies came out and said, look, we are going to make sure that there's no medical debt on there that's been paid and that medical debt after six months has to be reevaluated and all these different things, which I think is great. Um, I'm glad they're doing that. I don't know how successful they'll be at it. But we're going to work with a company that will allow us to sort of white label our own credit product. Mm -hmm. So in addition to doing what like a credit karma does, where you can get your regular credit score and you can see what's outstanding on your balances, we're going to focus on medical debt. And we're going to focus on the fact that you've got medical debt on there. By the way, you can always use MedZero to refinance right. that debt. It doesn't have to be a current bill. It could be an old yeah. bill. So you can always use us to go do that. So that'll, that'll be good for us. But in the end, it'll just be good for you as, a, as, a, as an individual to understand what is on your credit report as it re relates to medical debt. And is that still even current? And if it's not, then we'll, again, we'll reach out to the hospital and say, you got to take this off. Like this guy paid this debt or this guy refinanced it to us, whatever. Mm -hmm. So credit reporting focused on medical. Then we'll do some things around the HSA account. There's a lot of confusion around health savings accounts and how they should be used or shouldn't be used. You know, an FSA which came out first is called flexible spending account. If you allocate dollars to an FSA every year, it's a, it's a benefit, 
But at the end of the day, you have to use those dollars. Right. So everybody underfunds their FSAs, right? If you say you have $1,000 in bills that you're going to and you don't, and at the end of the year, everybody's scrambled. They're buying glasses and contacts right. and saline <laughs> solution and Band-Aids. And, you know, because if you don't do it, it goes back to the company. Well, with an HSA, that's not how it works. So not only do you get that tax benefit, but the HSA stays in there just like a 401k. Yeah, it just rolls over. In fact, the HSA is a better savings plan than a 401k because there's no tax in the way in, no tax as it grows and no tax on the way out. So, you know, our, I talked to a lot of people who are like, oh, I've got $2,000 in my HSA. I'm just going to use that. Well, that's the worst thing you could possibly do. Like literally you should keep that in there until you retire because you're going to need a couple hundred thousand dollars in retirement to support your medical expenses. Right. So what we, what we're going to do is create some calculators and sort of say, Hey, guess what? You think you should pay a thousand dollars out of your, out of your, uh, you know, HSA account for this bill. Well, you have access to free funds at net zero. So you could borrow that and repay it over time, still get the same tax benefit. And if you leave, you know, you're not, you're not really borrowing a thousand dollars. If you're 35 years old and you're going to retire when you're 62 and you have a chance to invest in ETFs through your HSAs, as most do these days, you're actually, you're actually borrowing $17,000 right now. That's what you're spending as opposed to a thousand because the growth, the compounding growth on those dollars is really impactful to you over time. So don't spend it. Hmm. Um, so we want to do a lot of education to really help people understand again, how to maximize what they're paying for and how to maximize what they, what, you know, the, the opportunities that they have. So that's the platform. It's going to be much broader. And then on top of that, the one last thing we're going to do just from an impact perspective is we're actually going to use a portion of the revenues that we generate uh, to fund the repurchase of, of medical debt for poverty stricken folk in, in a geographic area. So if I go to Microsoft, I'm going to go and I'm going to use some of the revenues that we generate and we're going to go buy uh, medical debt, not for Microsoft employees, but for people in the Redmond, uh, you know, Seattle area who can't afford, who had to go to the hospital, but they can't afford to repay because they're, you know, unfortunately under the poverty, poverty line. So we can go buy that back for pennies on the dollar and everybody kind of benefits from a community perspective. So we feel it's really important to you know, have an impact on society. And that's one of the things that we're going to do. How do you see this, this thing playing out? Is this uh, something you think it'll go public or, you know, cause I, to deliver on all of those different, you know, a, initiatives, I would think, that, you know, this probably isn't a, you know, take an A round, maybe a B round and sell it off. It sounds like you've got some long-term plans there. You think you guys will eventually end up taking it public? I mean, is it, do you want to build the next, um, you know, FinTech giant, or is this the type of thing where you, you think it to tuck in nicely into a port, the portfolio of a larger company and away you'll go? You know, I've been around the game too long to predict. Um, so I run the business and I recruit great people. I'm fortunate that I'm working with a lot of people I've worked with in the past at Care Payment and at WebMD WellMed. Um, and so we've got a really, really good team that I'm completely confident in here. And I will continue to expand that team. So I think we're in a great position today. I, you know, I just laid out my roadmap as of whatever today is, March 29th, whatever it is. Um, that will probably change by April 15th. Something else will right. come up, right? Yeah, just the way this business works is, uh, you know, you uncover some company that you didn't know before. Um, so, you know, I, I can't predict, you know, an IPO, I've been fortunate to go through one with WebMD. So, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to be at the executive, executive level there and participate in that. Um, so that's not, it's another financing, you know, vehicle basically from my perspective. Yeah. It's a branding vehicle because it helps you, helps more people understand who you sure. are. There's really good things about it because you can attract attractive, you know, attractive financing terms. There's some bad things about it and that you're now a public yep. company. And so there's just a bunch of requirements that come with that as it relates to accounting and reporting and, and expenses and then frankly, legal exposure. Um, so, you know, I, I look, would, would I go public? I mean, yeah, if I needed to, um, is that a stated goal of something that I have to get done? No, I want to grow a great business where people look at this. I mean, the one story I'll say about WebMD is when I had WellMed, I had the exact same product set and I'd sit next to somebody on an airplane or go to a dinner party or do whatever. And people would you know, be interested, but they really wouldn't care. I sit next to somebody on an airplane. I say, I work for WebMD. And they're like, oh my God, every single person I ever talked to had a story about WebMD. Oh, my mom just went there or I just joined yep. this group or I did. I mean, every single person. Yeah. So like that branding 
and the impact that company had on tens and tens of millions of people was fantastic. I would love to recreate that same thing here, meaning that I would love to have an impact on, you know, tens of millions of employees yeah. and ultimately make healthcare more affordable and accessible for these folks. And so with that as kind of a guiding light to me, you know, the, the financing aspect, it'll happen if we run a good business, regardless of whether I go through series E or whether we go public right. or whatever we do. Um, but you know, it's, I want to create a, a really rock solid uh, business that people rely yeah. on. Yeah. No, I mean, even if you guys deliver on just one or two of those initiatives, it's going to have a pr- pretty profound impact on the way um, we consume and enjoy healthcare in this country. If you can deliver on all of them, you're going to have a, a stone cold winner on your hands. Um, I, I, that's all I've got. I hope it's not an if. I hope it's a win. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, absolutely. You know, one thing I always like to give guess an opportunity to do is, uh, you know, a call to action. If people are seeing this and they're interested in uh, potentially, uh, you know, acquiring the services for their firm, or uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, somebody in the digital health uh, fintech arena is to say, this is a company that I'd, uh, you know, I'd like to, I could see myself getting, getting viscerally invested in this type of a, of an opportunity. What's the best way for uh, folks to reach out? Yeah, super easy. I mean, um, you know, it's probably multiple ways. I mean, one is medzero.com. We've got a, you know, a section in there that, uh, you know, you can fill out a little quick form, a little bit of information about yourself. And, and that uh, as a founder uh, led sales organization, that comes straight to me uh, and my co-founder Howard. So we will, uh, we will definitely see that if you respond to that form on there. Um, or you can obviously go to my LinkedIn page, uh, you know, and, uh, and check it out there. And, and I, I respond to those messages as you know, Mike, cause that's how we got connected. Yep. Um, I appreciate the, the support you've given us there. Um, and those are probably the two easiest ways to, uh, to get a hold of me. I mean, my email is straightforward. It's cjf at medzero.com. So you can also hit me on that. So yeah, we're excited. I mean, we're looking for obviously new customers. We're looking for great employees who have relevant experience. I don't want to be part of a startup with a, with a massive growth opportunity. Um, and then, uh, you know, we're looking for partners. So whether it's like I mentioned before, insurance brokers who will bundle us into their packages, whether it's other people that could see us as a part of their solution. We don't see a lot of people in our space and we think healthcare financing is, is critical and, and, and growing. I look at what a firm's done in the buy now, pay later space with Peloton and now with a variety of different groups They've got competitors like Klarna and others that are out there, but everything is buy now, pay later uh, as it relates, not everything, but a lot of things are now on the retail side of things on the internet. Healthcare is just a different beast. It's harder to get into um, and it's harder to navigate. And so we think we have a little competitive advantage and head start there. So we welcome, you know, partners, potential employees, and, you know, every day we try to welcome customers. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you're going to probably end up having more customers, uh, then, uh, then you could handle in, in no time here. Uh, it just makes too much sense. Uh, you know, like you said, when you talk to people and, um, you, 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 that you can, it's interesting when you're selling a product where, when you describe it to the customer and you can see the light bulb go off, you know, of like, huh, why didn't we think about that? Wishing you guys nothing but success, Craig, uh, really appreciate you coming on the show today and, uh, definitely, uh, let's stay in touch and, um, once things uh, end up developing a little bit, maybe we can get you back on for a recap one of these days. That sounds great. I appreciate the opportunity. I had a great time today. You asked some fantastic questions. So um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be glad to come back on anytime you have. All me. right. Appreciate it. Thank you folks for tuning in. Uh, and uh, right, we'll, thanks, we'll catch you guys on the next episode of the Bleeding Edge of Digital Health. 